came back the following day. Sometime during the course of the following day, he did call and stated that Lieutenant Governor Johnson had granted the leave. At this point, I want to say again that I emphatically refuse to accept any responsibility for Mr. Barry's leave. At this point, gentlemen, I want to say to you and ladies that I appreciate the privilege of appearing before you. It is my desire to be as helpful as possible. Since shortly after Mr. Barnett's uh, campaign was, I became Mr. Barnett's campaign manager in 1959, my wife and my four children and I have been subjected to one wave of terror after another. We have lost or are in now in the process of losing all of our material possessions. Since the very publicity, my creditors have moved in and this is what has happened. Number one, my telephones in my home and my office were cut off immediately because of a back bill. Next, the finance company came to get, to get our household furniture. Thirdly, I was advised by a savings and loan association I was subleasing an office from that I would have to put up over $8,000 advance rent covering two years or get out. My time is up today. Four foreclosure proceedings on our home have been instituted. These are some of the bigger accounts I owe. I say this, gentlemen, simply to say that even though I have lost everything else, I thank God that I have not lost the constitutional right to stand up and fight against taking the blame for something that I am absolutely not responsible for. I therefore appreciate very much the privilege of appearing before you. Now I realize that the purpose of this committee is not to air old political linen. But for the record, I just want to make a brief remark about that and then I'm finished and I'll stand for your examination. I gave Ross Barnett everything I had to give. Hundreds of others were persuaded by me to do likewise. When the campaign was over, he cast us to the political wheels. I'm talking about my friends and I. I've never been able to do anything for myself and I've never been able to help my friends. He stood by and watched us devoured in his very presence. He made an untold number of solemn promises and commitments in my very presence prior to his election. Insofar as I can ascertain, he has either forgotten them or simply didn't have the ability to remember. Frankly, I don't know which is correct. That is, I don't know if he willfully lied in all these many instances or whether he just didn't realize what he was doing. Now to document one of those promises that I'm talking about, I'd like to present to this committee this original letter dated September 4, 1959 on the letterhead of Barnett Jones and Montgomery signed by Mr. Ross R. Barnett, Governor-elect. It's addressed to me and it is as follows. Dear John, at the appropriate time, it is my intention to offer you an appointment as Vice Chairman of the Agricultural and Industrial Board to serve during my administration as Governor. In the meantime, I want you to begin immediately to draft a detailed plan for the most dynamic economic development program our people have ever seen. This program should include your recommendations on at least the following important matters. One, staff personnel. And to digress a minute on the strength of this letter, I went out and contacted and made a tentative contract of employment with a man who I consider one of the best professional industrial developers in this country. And on the strength of this, he resigned and lost his job. They refused to hire him later. Secondly, board personnel for the board. He asked me to go out and make commitments to a select group of uh, heavyweight men throughout this state who could set down a policy for the industrial development of this state and tell them that he was willing and ready to point them to that board and that my selection and agreement with them was tantamount to their appointment. 
I have been embarrassed, humiliated, no end as a result of the discussions I had with prospecting members of the board, and I don't think a one of them was a point. An industrial development program, a tourist development program, an agricultural development plan, a public information and advertising program, a program of basic research, a proposed budget for the ANI board for the next biennium, a procedure for the board's operation, 10, any additional legislation which might be necessary to implement the total program. Please confer with me from time to time as you develop this program. No statements concerning your work should be made until full agreement on the plan is reached by the new board. Sincerely, Ross R. Barnett. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to hand this to you, please. Now, this administration has done irreparable harm to the lives of many people. I can't correct that situation. I've tried desperately to do so. I've tried desperately to be loyal. But again, I find myself in the jungles with my hands tied behind me, being devoured by the wolves. At this point, I can only apologize, and I want to make this a matter of public record for the entire state of Mississippi, I can only apologize to the people of Mississippi for my role in getting Ross Barnett elected to the governor of Mississippi. I'm truly sorry. Now, I say this, ladies and gentlemen, not because my family and I have had great suffering inflicted upon us, because I have been a party to inflicting so much suffering on so many others uh, by virtue of my role in electing Barnett to the governorship. And in concluding, I say to you that I have no political ambitions, I have no political alignments, I seek only the continued privilege of practicing my chosen profession, in my chosen city, Jackson, Mississippi, and raising my children right here in my native state of Mississippi. I thank you very much, and I will attempt to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman, which you might have. since approximately February of 1959, sir. As a matter of fact, Mr. Gray, you and Mr. Frazier are close personal and political friends, are you not? I consider that so, yes, sir. Did you think a moment ago... If I might, if I might just uh, add a little to that answer. Yes. Uh, I made the, pre the statement previously that I am not now in politics, 
and I would confine the answer to, the, to that point. I would say that we're close personal friends. Yeah. Well, prior to this time, you've been close personal and political friends. Yes, sir. Have you not? Did I understand you to say a moment ago that the first time you had had any knowledge of the Ox case was when it was brought to your attention by Mr. Fraley on November the 27th, 1961? That is correct, sir. And that was the time <coughs> you were having a luncheon with Mr. Fraley and Mr. Day. And was Mr. Powell with you on that occasion? No, sir, he was not. Not on November the 27th? No, sir. Yes. Now, Mr. Greg, at that time, did you know the status of the box case? No, sir. At that time, Mr. Greg, did you, did you know that Box was one of the participants in the robbery of Fairchild Construction Company in Hattiesburg? No, sir, I did not. I don't know how that escaped my attention because I saw a number of newspaper clippings in his file, but I just didn't know. Well, when did you first learn that Fox was one of the participants in the Fairchild Construction Company robbery at Hattiesburg? When I reviewed his file on, in, uh, at Parchman in Mr. Jones' office on, I believe I said, November 28th. I believe you stated a moment ago that Mr. Day contacted you about representing Fox. Yes, sir. He suggested that I do it and uh, advised me that I had, he had had some contact with his family. Now, this was on what date was that, Mason? That was the that was the morning prior to the time we made our first trip up to Parchman, and we had previously scheduled that trip to go to Ruleville, Mississippi. Yeah. That would have been November 28, 1961. To the best of my memory. Yeah. Now, Mr. Day did not mention the matter to you, even though Mr. Fraley brought it up on November the 27th. He didn't mention the matter to you until the next day. <coughs> That is correct. It's November the 28th. That is correct. I don't remember us having any subsequent conversation about it after we left the lunch. Yes. Now, who was present when you first discussed the matter with Mr. Day? That is, the possibility of representing Aubrey Fox. I think Mr. Day, just, just Mr. Day, uh, <coughs> I believe we talked about it on the telephone. Talked about it on the telephone. Yes. Yes. <coughs> you, of course, discussed the matter when you went to Parchment. Yes, sir. On November the 28th. Yes, sir. Now, you were coming on your trip to Parchment <coughs> by Mr. Day and Mr. Powell. That is correct. At Marshall's house. Yes, sir. Have you ever heard him identified as Blackjack Powell? No, sir. Not until this publicity started. Did he ever tell you his name was Blackjack Powell? No, sir. Did you know that he'd ever been an operator of a nightclub up in Holmes County? No, sir. You knew absolutely nothing about his past history? <clears throat> nothing. Until you met him on November the 27th, 1960. The one you had never seen, Mr. Powell, or ever heard of. That is correct. Yes. I, I have difficulty explaining that, too, because I must have been out of the state when all this was going on. I don't know anything about it. Yes. Now, Mr. Craig, you left Jackson, and you had Mr. Powell and Mr. Day. Now, whose car were you trapped? In Mr. Lloyd Day's uh, 1961 Cadillac. Black, wasn't it? No, sir. What color was it? Uh, light tan, as I recall. Mr. Lloyd Day, 1961, light tan cap. I believe you said that you arrived at the penitentiary late that afternoon. That is my, uh, rem that is my memory, yes. Sir. Yeah. And you then went to the penitentiary, went into the superintendent's office. Yes, sir. And you contacted Mr. Fred Jones. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Craig, at that time, who was with you? Was Mr. Day and Mr. Powell accompanying you? Yes, sir. 
What conversation, if any, did you have at that time with Mr. Jones? <coughs> Uh, as I indicated, I had previously called Mr. Jones yes. and asked him that if I made it up there on that particular day, if I could uh, talk to Aubrey Bites. And Mr. Jones assured me that uh, I could, that that was the prerogative as an attorney, and to come on up and uh, I could give him his, uh, my approximate rival time, he would have Bites there to talk to him. Was Potts there when you arrived? I don't think so. Now, Seemed to me, well, oh, right. go ahead. We visited with, with uh, Fred uh, for several minutes. We didn't talk much about the uh, Botts case. Uh, I reviewed the file, and he and Mr. Day and Mr. Powell con conducted the conversation there about the general affairs of the penitentiary. How much cotton had made in one thing or another. Now, Mr. Fred? Mr. Day contacted you about representing Mr. Box. Yes, sir. And at that time, you reviewed the file. Yes, sir. Mr. Gregg, as a practicing attorney, on the basis of the state of the case at that time, what advantage would you have done to assist Mr. Box? On the basis of the file, I couldn't see anything I could do. Uh, he had a as I recall, a very rough past criminal record. Uh, he had uh, uh, his, the reports uh, growing around, uh, surrounding his conviction in Hattiesburg were adverse to anything which might uh, have been done for him. But at that point, sir, I couldn't make up my mind one way or another where I could do him any good without talking to him. That was my opinion. As a matter of fact, Mr. Gray, didn't the final disclose that Mr. Fox had been sentenced and had been committed to the state penitentiary on July 19, 1961? Uh, I don't recall the exact date, but I do recall that he hadn't been there very long. As a matter of fact, he's been there almost four months, though, hasn't he? I think so, but I'm not best about that. Well, from July 19, to November 28, 1961, before they four months. That's right. If you say that's when he was committed. Well, you examined the file, didn't you? Yes, sir, I'm, I'm, but I don't recall the date he was committed. Now, at that time, I believe you said Mr. Jones sent for Mr. Box, for Aubrey Box. Well, I believe he had previously sent for him. Uh, I, I don't recall exactly how that happened, but I was uh, aware of the fact that Mr. Box was on his way to the office. All right, sir. Upon the arrival of, <coughs> of Potts in the office, what then transpired? Uh, Mr. Jones uh, asked us to excuse ourselves for a few minutes. Now, where was this conference held then? That was in Mr. Jones' office, sitting in front of his desk. Yes. Mr. Uh, Dave Powell and I went outside the office and stood in the lobby for a few minutes, I don't remember how long, and then Mr. Butts and Mr. Jones came out. As I said previously, it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Jones was going to supper, and uh, Butts indicated that he didn't want to talk to me, he wanted to talk to uh, Day and Powell, and I don't remember whether Mr. Jones had gone when this transpired or not, but <coughs> I don't remember what whether he was standing right there, but I told him that was all right, and the guards uh, suggested that we use the comfort room down the hall, that they use the comfort room, and they went on down there and talked to them. Then what further conversation did you have with Fox? Uh, well, after they had talked with him for some time, it seemed to me like about 45 minutes, Mr. Day came out and asked me if I was would go on in and talk with him. And I went on in and sat down at the conference table and proceeded to talk to him <laughs> and started asking him about his case, about this uh, Hattiesburg conviction. And I asked him questions about his prior arrest over in Louisiana, the time he had served over there. 
Uh, he was most uh, reluctant to talk to me and told me that he frankly thought I was an FBI agent. I was trying to pull some kind of trick on him. I said I was invited to come up here and talk to you fella by a, a man who has been contacted by your family, a client of mine, and we just won't make an issue of it. If you don't want to talk, that's fine with me. And uh, at that point, I started to leave, and then he asked me about my fee, and we had a discussion about that. And I told him that I was going to uh, price myself off of his market, that I had had no success whatsoever in representing convicts, and I didn't think I could do much for him. Now, Mr. Drake, did you at any time in your conversation <coughs> with Fox tell him that you would obtain a formal pardon for him if he would make a disclosure as to where the Romanian loot from the Falcon Child Construction Company robbery was located? Emphatically, no. Is it not a fact that you assured him that he would be given a full pardon? Pardon if he was prepared to do this. No, sir. No such statement was made. No such statement. See whether or not Mr. Greg, if you you did state to my brother that he'd have to raise ten thousand dollars. Yes, sir. And in that connection, did you not also state to him that if he did, he was going to be given a ten day then a 30 day suspension, then a one year suspension, and would ultimately obtain a full pardon. No, sir, I know of no such procedure. Yes. <laughs> but you did tell him that it would take $10,000 to get me cranked up. To get you cranked up. <laughs> now, Mr. Gregg, you, you say that you don't, there wasn't anything much you could do for it. And you tell the committee, though, that you told him that you would charge him the fee of $10,000 to do what you could for him. Is that what I understand? That's, that's about to say that. But I told him, I said, boy, I'm, I'm going to price myself off of your market. I'm going to uh, have to have $10,000 in front before I move. And he said, that won't be any trouble. I can get that up just like that. I believe you stated a moment ago, Mr. Gregg, that after you discussed the proposition of a $10,000 fee, a call was placed to his parents in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That is correct. Do you recall what the name of the parents are? The name of the parents? Refresh your memory. I believe it's Lloyd Potts. No, sir, I can't. I, I, did, I do remember placing the call to the number which he gave me. Greg, did you listen in on any part of that conversation? No, sir. I was, excuse me. Yes. Uh, I was all further than uh, you are from me during the course of the conversation. Did either Mr. Day or Mr. Powell listen in on that conversation? Uh, Do you recall? No, sir. They were, I don't know where they were. They were somewhere else on the premises, but they weren't in the room. the telephone conversation, he came back to me and gave me that report. Yes. All right, so now what other conversation took place between either you and Bots or Dave and Power, all of you together? Uh, none. I told him that I uh, would be home most of the day Sunday and I would be looking for his parents' call and that's it. We left. I turned him back over to God. Do you recall what time you left the penitentiary that night? Uh, it would have been uh, something maybe 7.30 to 8 o'clock. I don't recall exactly. 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Probably returning to Jackson around midnight. Yes. yes. Now, Mr. Gray, did you then return to penitentiary on the 29th? No, the 29th, the next day, it's been Wednesday? No, sir. Do you know whether or not Mr. Day or Mr. Powell returned to the penitentiary? No, sir, I do not. 
as of that time, November the 9th, November 28th, 1961, had you had any discussion with anyone <coughs> concerning Kimball Beck? No, sir. Never heard the name. <coughs> had you had any discussion with Mr. Martin Fraley about the possibility of a parole, granted a parole to Aubrey Potts? No, sir. <coughs> Had you had a discussion with Martin Fraley or with anyone else concerning the granting of a parole, or a suspension, or a pardon as of November the 28th, 1961? No, sir. Now, I believe you stated that you received a call from someone on December the 3rd. 1961, which was Sunday. Uh, that, that was Mr. Day. That was uh, after I had gone down to Puckett yes. and returned and was home sometime that evening. I don't recall the exact hour. And at that time, what did he tell you as to whether or not Botts had obtained the money? He told me that he had not been contacted. He didn't know that. No, I, wait. He told me that he had received a call no, he didn't tell me that either. Let me think about it. That, this is Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, December the 3rd. No, we didn't talk much about Botts uh, on that call. He told me that uh, he was coming to Jackson next morning and wanted to know if I would be free for conference. Yeah. And I told him I had to be in Simpson County Court that uh, I might finish up my business uh, in time to come back for an afternoon session or I might not. Yeah. Uh, he said that uh, he was anxious to have me go up in the Delta, that he had built a grain elevator up there for somebody, and they still owed him the money. And if we had any such, I don't recall uh, whether he said on that occasion that we might go up and see bots or not, but he did say that the next morning. Well, when did you first learn that Aubrey Potts had not obtained the $10,000 that was necessary? Now, I believe Mr. Day told me that after I got back from Simpson County Court and met with him on December 4, he said he received a call from Botts' mother, who uh, put up a pitiful plea and complained about the fee. Said they just couldn't get it up. It indicated that they had, that she couldn't get it up, but some other way had been devised to take care of it. Now, Mr. Greg, I believe you stated that on the morning of December 4, 1961, you then took another trip up into the Delta. And by whom were you accompanied on that occasion? Mr. M. M. Powell and Mr. Lloyd Day. Mr. Lloyd Day. And in whose car were you riding that day? We were in Mr. Powell's car that day. And what kind of car does Mr. Powell Mr. Powell drives a black cat. A black cat. Yes. <laughs> now, Mr. Gray, when you arrived at the penitentiary, what time was it? Well, it was late again. I remember remarking to Fred Jones that, uh, boy, you're a glutton for punishment or something like this. It was well past uh, close of business time, and he was sitting there dictating out of a code book to Mrs. Kim. And it was beyond 5 o'clock. It, it was just uh, it, it was just apparently just before supper time at the guest house, and I don't know what time that is, because shortly thereafter he asked me to go to supper. Well, had you made any call prior to that time to have Fox present when you arrived on that occasion? Yes, sir, I think I did. Do you recall from where you called? I believe a place to call from Yazoo City. I'm not sure. I might have placed it from my office. Uh, but 
My memory would have to be refreshed on that. Well, it was after, uh, it was well after 12 o'clock. I can't even remember if I ate any lunch that day. Uh, must have been beyond 1 o'clock because I got back to the office from Simpson County and things were rather hectic and uh, my secretary indicated that Mr. Day was most impatient that he was over to Sun and Sand waiting for me to take off. I, I believe I placed a call from office. Don't recall having completed it there. I think I placed it again in Yazoo City. All right, sir. Now, when you went into the penitentiary that night, who were four couples? Mr. Day and Mr. Powell. Mr. Day and Mr. Powell. All right. And, and you contacted Mr. Craig Jones? Yes, sir. <laughs> Was Bots available when you got there? I don't believe so. Seems, seems to me as if... Uh, we delayed a little that time, but I won't, I won't be emphatic about that. I just don't recall. Well, in all events, you had a conversation, had a conference with Mr. Wood Fox, Aubrey Fox. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Who was present at the time you had the conference? Well, sir, uh, Mr. Jones <coughs> and Mrs. Kinnamer <coughs> were dictating back over there at, at their office. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Harper, are you familiar with Mr. Jones's office? Yes, sir, I certainly am. Well, you, you know that in his office there is a conference table over in the corner. His office sits uh, back, his desk sits back here, correct? And there's a conference table up here. Now, maybe I've got that reversed. I don't know. But anyway, over in the corner there's a conference table. And, uh, as I recall, they stayed there and uh, worked a little longer, Mr. Ken and, and Mrs. Kinnamer and Mr. Jones, Mr. Day and Mr. Powell and I and sat down at the conference table to talk to Botts. There were several people in and out. I must have shaken hands with a half a dozen people while I'm trying to conduct this conversation. Uh, finally, as I recall it, uh, Day and Powell went out and Mr. Jones asked me to go to supper. I had a very unsuccessful interview with him at that point because of all the people in the room and it wasn't a private interview and he wasn't willing to talk and I couldn't get much out of it. Let me ask you this question, Mr. Greg. On the first occasion, on this first day, when you first arrived, when you were sitting at the conference table with that's the date. This was the time that Fox himself told you that he could not raise money. Is no, right? no. You mean the first time you went up there? No, sir. I'm talking about on oh. the first contact you had with Fox on December the 4th. No, he didn't tell me he couldn't raise the money. He told me that he had it uh, fixed up, had fixed up another way to get me the money that the, his parents couldn't come up with. That his parents couldn't come up with. That is right. Yes. While you were sitting at the conference table, isn't it a fact that Marshal Powell then asked Fox to go with them to get the loot and that Fox refused to go? That is absolutely untrue. No, sir. He just said he had a buddy who could go out and get up and see. That he, that he said that he's my outside man. That he handles things on the outside for me. Uh, I didn't hear the name Kimball Berry until after I had gone to supper, returned to the office, and uh, we started uh, fooling around with the business of trying to get up the letter of return, a letter of uh, file of return. Fair, 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 fair,
was never mentioned as being had by Fox. No, sir. I asked him about it on the very first conversation I had. Yeah. Uh, and he told me he refused to talk to him. He said, uh, yes, I heard, sir. yes, all right. Did he ever make any statement to you about the loot that he took <coughs> in the fair town of the Rockies? No, sir. I asked him on this second interview to level with me about it. I said, I, if I'm going to do you any good, I've got to know these things. And that's when he told me that he had told, said, I, I've told a bunch of people a lot of things. I'm not going to tell you that you agree to take the case. Said, I've told people I've put it uh, at the end of a pier in Lake Michigan in a waterproof safe, and so on and so forth. Mr. Craig, did you at any time discuss this case with Mr. Fred Hill? Yes, sir. Did you discuss it with him while you were having supper? No, sir, we didn't have supper together. You did not have supper? <coughs> no, sir. Where did you eat supper that night, Mr. Craig? I ate at the guest house. Go ahead. You waiting for me? Yes, sir. Well, he told me he was going to his apartment, that he felt a little lousy, and he didn't feel like entertaining the guest, and if I didn't mind, he'd like to excuse himself from going over to the guest house. I mean to his apartment, but I beg your pardon. Mr. Gray, didn't I hold Fox State you, Mr. Powell and Mr. Dave, that the loot was in a safety deposit box of kind of money? No, sir. What did he say to you was in a safety deposit box of kind of money? He told me that, that uh, this friend of his <coughs> could go to Kaiser, Arkansas and get my feet. And I said, now, is that part of this Fairchild loot? And he said, no. He said, it's some money I stashed back there a long time before the Fairchild robbery. Uh, and then I asked him why he would uh, want to conduct the Fairchild robbery in the first place if he had $10,000 stashed. Made him get a map down and show me where Kaiser, Arkansas was. Never heard of it. But, uh, <coughs> oh, we, we went over the road uh, pretty rough on that subject. Where was the, where'd you find the map? He found one. He produced one in Mr. Jones' office from somewhere. He was picked it up amongst the papers. Who's that? He being Bob. a Bob. Yes, uh-huh. Yes. Now, after you had supper and you went back, then you had a con another conference with, with Bob. Yes, sir. Then, is that when you prepared or helped him prepare a power of attorney? Yes, sir. Where's the, uh, that's when you took, I believe you stated you took the law book down. Yes, sir. And as a result of the preparation of the power of attorney, <coughs> such was executed before Mrs. Kemmer. Yes, sir. Who is the secretary of Fred Jones. Yes, sir. Now, how late was that, Mr. Gray? Well, it was after supper. It must have been past 7 o'clock. Yeah. Well, that's long after our office hours at the penitentiary. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But she had been working there continuously, as I observed it, at her desk. Mr. Gregg, I hand you here a blurred copy, but nevertheless a photostatic copy, and ask you if that is not a true copy of the power of attorney that was prepared and executed by Aubrey Botts on December 4, 1961. <laughs>
Mr. Harper, I can, I can read this copy. All right, but uh, all I can say in response to that, in truth and in fact, is that I guess it is. I don't know. You don't know. Oh, Mr. Craig, you sold Arm Corporate Bot's executor power of attorney, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. And this, uh... Is that his signature? I wouldn't know about that. Well, didn't you see him execute it? Yes, sir. Well, didn't you, didn't you take it and have Miss Kenema to notarize yes, it? Yes, sir. I certainly did. Well, Mr. Gregg, you do know that it, that's his signature, doesn't it? The no, one sir. that he put on there, anyhow, whether well, it's his true signature or Mr. not. Mr. Harper, I couldn't recognize his signature. I don't recognize it. But uh, this, uh, this looks like the instrument, a uh, copy of the instrument, but I don't want to make an issue of that. I've, yes. I've told you that I uh, assisted in preparing it, and this looks like it. Yes. Uh, I advised uh, uh, Mr. Botts that I thought it was absolutely worthless and a waste of time, but I would help him as a favor. Well, now, at that time, Mr. Gray, you were advised of the fact that there was a content of the six deposit box in the Kaiser <coughs> Bank and Trust Company of Kaiser, Arkansas, when you... Box told me that. Yes. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> you, you generally, what the, the terms of the uh, power of attorney would authorize Kimball Berry to go there, whether or not. Yes. Well, uh, we had some considerable discussion about that. Yes. In the first instance, I told him that I didn't, uh, I didn't think the power of attorney to get him, get him or anybody else in a lockbox. And I, I, I wouldn't know where the key was. Why didn't he just uh, give his man the key? He said he didn't have the key, and that's when he gave me this cotton bull about having told some he swallowed it, and he told others he told it and missed it the river. Uh, at this point, I, I reached over, pulled down the coat on the powers of attorney, laid it open, and said, here, boy, you do it yourself. But then you later had to assist him in completing it. Yes. Well, don't you know what you helped him complete, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to go any further on this. I, I'd like to offer this in, in evidence anyway. All you right. Get this to the witness's testimony. Well, I, I don't want to make an issue with it about it, but I don't, uh, I don't, I just don't recognize that as Bot's signature. That looks like the thing we prepared, but I'm not going to identify it properly. of Mrs. Kinnamer. May I have it? I'll give you a little demonstration. Well, that's all right. You just don't. All right. I walked in, and at this point, I think he had it in his hand, but I took it from him, and he said, uh, don't let her see it. And I said, well, you got to have it notarized, Mrs. Kinnamer. Are you a notary? He said, yes, I am. Will you notarize this man's signature? And I turned everything down except the, uh, the place where he signed it. I think he signed it right there in here present. I don't know. Yes. Then what happened? To then the I handed it back the box. Handed it back the box. Yes. Sir. Did you ever see the power of attorney again? No, sir. <clears throat> All right, so then what did you do? Uh, <coughs> I think I got my men and came back to God. Stop. I uh, got with Powell and Bay and came back to God. Mr. <coughs> Greg, were you present? Kimball Barrett came to the office on the night of December 4, 1961? Well, sir, as I indicated previously, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Now, I talked, I, I met a number of people. Uh, I talked to uh, Day afterwards about which one of those people were Barry, and he said that, that I shook hands with him. He was right out there in the lot. Did you ever have any conversation with Barry? No, sir. Mr. Gray, did you ever ask Martin Fraley to assist you in obtaining a suspension 
I call Mr. Freely from Yazoo City on the night of December 4th. And at that time, I asked Mr. Freely if, if, for purposes of verification, because Botts had already told me that he had, uh, that Barry had this leave. If he knew anything about Barry's leave and if he had been granted one. Uh, Mr. Freely's conversation was, uh, we didn't talk much on the phone. He said he would check into it and call me back. He called me back the next day and advised me that Barry had been granted a, uh, a leave. And as I understood it, he said he was going on a routine Christmas leave. I don't recall the details. Now, Mr. Gregg, the question was, did you ever request Mr. Freeman to, to, uh, to assist you in obtaining a suspension for Kimball Barry? No, sir. He did not? No, sir. You said, was anyone present in the conference with Dave, Powell, Bosch, and you after the uh, power of attorney was signed? Was anybody else present? <coughs> After the power of attorney was signed. Now we walked out in the lobby and there were a gang of people out there. Yes, I understand that, but before you walked out of the lobby, and all four of you were there, was there any other for the conversation? No, sir. Was there any conversation or arrangements made at any time in your presence with Kim Perry as to what was to be done? No, sir. Was there any arrangements ever made, as far as you know, as to what disposition was to be made of the funds obtained in the safe deposit box of Kaiser the Bank and Trust Company of Kaiser Arkansas? No, sir. I told uh, Botts at the time, and I thought it was uh, that he was pulling my leg, to the best of my memory. I believe you stated a moment ago, Mr. Drake, and I just didn't understand it, that after you had completed your business on the night of December 4th with Mr. with Fox, that you walked out and that you later had a conversation with Mr. Jones. Yes. Sir. Now, would you mind stating again what that conversation was? All right, sir. Uh, we, he invited me to step into the conference room briefly with him. Uh, he told me, he asked me what I thought about it. I told him I didn't know what to think, that I didn't uh, attach much significance to anything that uh, Botts had said, that I wanted to reemphasize that I was not representing him. Uh, Mr. Jones related the trip that he had had down to Hattiesburg and told me that uh, at that point he was confused. He didn't know either what to think about Botts and some of his stories. He told me that... Uh, that if I did decide to represent him, uh, and he came up with my fee, that he might s later have a plan that he had been thinking about how we might go about getting his suspension. Now, who, now who stated that to you? Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones? Yes. Uh -huh. gotcha. uh, I asked him uh, who was going to do it. I told him I didn't think I could get Barnett to do it. He said, well, he didn't know exactly either, but uh, if... Uh, I decided to take it on. We talked some more about it later. Now, this is Mr. Fred Jones, Superintendent of the Penitentiary. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, a moment ago, you said, said something about a $75,000. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, that's what I want you to tell uh, me about again. Yes, you know, sir. Yes, sir. Well, he told me that uh, it, it might be done. Excuse me. He being Fred Jones. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That it might be accomplished, uh, that if it could be accomplished, he thought it would take... Uh, Around seventy-five thousand dollars to get the job done. Mr. Gregg, did you go into? Did you follow that any further as to what he meant by getting the job done? No, sir. What was your reply to that? 
I told him I didn't believe him, and he said, well, he didn't think too much of it either, that uh, uh, I was, uh, didn't think I wanted to have anything else to do with Brother Botts, and I was heading back to Jackson. Then you left the penitentiary after that time, and left with Powell, Powell today, right. and Powell's black Cadillac. Yes, sir. Go back to Jackson. Yes, sir. Have you been back to the penitentiary on this line since that time? No, sir, nor any other man. Have you had any further connection with Kimball Ferry? No, sir. Now, Mr. Gregg, just a moment ago, I want two more questions I want to ask. A moment ago, you testified that you notified Motors Insurance Corporation. I didn't say that, but you're right. Yes. Pretty good investigator, Mr. Yes. Hart. Now, Mr. Gregg, as a matter of fact, you didn't notify Motors Insurance Corporation of the loss of an automobile until December 21st, 1961 at 9.05 a.m., that right? That is absolutely incorrect. All right. What date was it? I don't, re I don't recall the date. But it, uh, uh, the first thing I had to do was get up the policy number. I uh, <coughs> called Mr. Day's secretary. No, my secretary called his secretary. And we were two or three or four days, I don't know, but it certainly wasn't that long getting that policy number, at which time I contacted a lady by telephone at the office of the Motors Insurance Corporation and asked someone to come to see me. Uh, several days elapsed, I don't remember how many, but uh, eventually a gentleman did come to see me. Uh, meantime, I had asked Mr. Day to try to get some action on it down in Gulfport uh, because from the man he purchased the policy from. And uh, he told, as I remember, he told me that he had contacted someone down there. But I want to make this clear that geese, so forth, and whereas, from the point of national defense, is mishap, either natural or by enemy action, occurred on the Mississippi River, the Tennessee Tong Baby Waterways Slack Water Canal would furnish an alternate route for vital goods and materials, plus shortening the present water route from Redstone Arsenal to Cape Canaveral by 1,200 miles, over which missiles could be shipped quickly with far less expense, thereby contributing greatly to our national defense. And whereas, Appearances before the Public Works Co Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee of the House and Senate are scheduled during the next 30 days. And whereas Senator Kennedy endorsed the project as a candidate for president in 1960, therefore be it resolved that the Mississippi Labor Council, F of L, CIO, in convention, assembled April the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 1962, go on record as Hartley approving and endorsing this project. Be it further resolved that similar state labor bodies in Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky be furnished copies of this resolution urging their concurrence and support. And be it finally resolved that copies be furnished to George Meany, President, F of LCIO, urging his personal and active support for the Tennessee Tong Big Day project. Mr. Chairman, the committee concurs in this resolution, and I move its adoption. Thank you. Second motion. You've heard the committee's report, the motion to adopt the resolution, and we did have a second. Do we have any discussion? Yes, they're, they're passing some out now. This might be one of them. We don't have it. They were supposed to have been put out, I thought, yesterday. I thought they'd put those out. We'll, uh, we'll provide you with copies if you don't have one. Just uh, remind us of it. Now, we're going to call on our new, uh, newly elected vice president, Brother Marvin Taylor, who lives in the section that this Tom Bigby waterway will directly affect. We're going to ask him to discuss the matter with you just briefly, Brother Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the first place, I feel inadequate 
to properly discuss this important and enormous project that not only will affect the welfare of every citizen in that particular area, but I believe in ever it will affect the welfare of every citizen in the whole southern United States. Now, I believe you might be interested in having a little bit of the background that prompted this resolution in the first place. I'm sure a lot of you people will remember Mr. Glover Wilkins, who was campaign manager and the, uh, uh, for Carol Garden for governor. Glover Wilkins is one of the full-time paid commissioners promoting this project. Mr. Wilkins asked me some time ago if, if this organization would be interested in knowing something about this matter and after knowing something about it, go on record as supporting it. He had talked to some of our people at the top level, the AFL-CIO, and he was asking their support of this measure and they suggested that this project, or uh, that is the promotion of this project, begin at the more or less state level. And later, if it, if it passed that uh, point, then it could come on up to the national AFL, international AFL CIO, and they would support it at that level. Now, this is a highly political matter, just as practically all of these matters are. In the first place, one of the questions I asked Mr. Wilkins was this. In the light of the fact that we have in our state of Mississippi more or less an anti-administration group of congressmen and senators, if that would not be detrimental in getting this measure passed, and he said that definitely was a factor in this whole proposition. That was one reason he was asking our support to help to counteract some of the, uh, the matters that might be detrimental in getting this thing passed in the first place. He did mention that since these other three states, Alabama, Tennessee, and as the resolution states, Kentucky having come in just this year, to promote this project, that having some more liberal people maybe in those states than we have in this state would also help to counterbalance some of the anti-administration leadership in this state. And it's, that, and it's in, it that, with that background that this thing came up in the first place. Now you might want to know a few things, uh, and you may already know as much about this as we do, and as I do, but this has to do with flood control and a slack water route coming from Demopolis, Alabama to Pickwick Lake. That's approximately 250 miles, I believe. And there being a difference in sea level of several hundred feet, it would be necessary to have a series of locks and dams built on this waterway, together with one section of the route to be canaled over a ridge to connect it actually with the Pickwick Lake. Now that within itself, just the construction alone would furnish jobs and, and furnish payrolls to construction people for years to come. And then uh, once that thing is built, there will, uh, we are told, and we have no reason to doubt it, that it will almost become another Ruhr Valley. There will be smokestacks of industries that will line the banks of that canal from Demopolis, Alabama to the Tennessee Pickwick Lake. We hope that the delegates here will attempt to, on the basis of what has been brought to your attention, that you will get more interested in this project, that you will study it, that you will talk it, that you will promote it. And I feel it has been an honor to be to having been asked in the first place by this authority to lend our support and aid in its implementation. I am heartily in favor of it, 
and I, I feel sure that we will have unanimous, unanimous support of this resolution. I thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Brother Taylor. Do we have further discussion on the motion to adopt? Not all in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Of the clerk. Legislative committee has one more resolution. This is of vital interest to the building and trades groups especially. Resolution 18, do you have this one? Someone stick up a hand if you have this one. Good. Submitted by the executive board. Whereas, ever since the so-called Denver Building Trades Rule was established by a decision of the Supreme Court, and whereas, under this ruling, a number of local unions of the Building Trades Department have been sued for damages that run into hundreds of thousands of dollars when their activities consisted only in peaceful picketing of a job site where non-union and union workers were employed. And whereas, in a dissenting opinion, Justice Douglas said, all the union asked was that union men not be compelled to work alongside of non-union men on the same job. And whereas, President Eisenhower recommended the reversal of the Denver Building Trades Rule in his message of January the 11th, 1954, again repeating the recommendation January the 23rd, 1958. And whereas, President Kennedy, in speaking to the 6th Building Trades Legislative Conference, March the 15th, 1960, said, no union member should be denied the right to picket sites that require him to work side by side with non-union workers. And whereas, there is pending in the present Congress Senate Bill 640, introduced by Senator McNamara, Democrat of Michigan, and House Resolution 2955 by Congressman Frank Thompson, Democrat of New Jersey. And having substantial bipartisan support which provides for the restoration of the historic rights of union members to picket under the above named conditions. Therefore be it resolved that the Mississippi Labor Council in convention assembled on April the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 1962 go on record as approving and supporting these bills. And be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to each of our senators and congressman and to the FLL-CIO legislative representative Andrew Baumuller and C.J. Haggerty, president, FLL-CIO Building and Trades Council. Mr. Chairman, the committee concurs in this resolution and I move its adoption. You've heard the committee's report, the motion to adopt the resolution. I have a second? Second to the motion. Any discussion? I think I should point out just briefly that this is the most vital area in regards to the building trades groups. We have in the state courts today, in the state in Mississippi state courts, a case that arose because of this type of a situation brought about by the Building Trades Council in Hattiesburg. This is the most vital question for these groups. A contractor can do this, and this is how simple it is. I'll try to draw you just a simple picture. You can sign a contract with one organization, have just a handful of union members on his payroll, the rest of the job can be rat. The Building Trades Center prevented from picketing that as a non-union contractor. This is what it's all about. The case we have before the state courts is in the form of an injunction removing the pickets that the group set up around the Pontiac refinery down outside of Hattiesburg. 
We have any discussion on the motion to adopt? Not all in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that we discharge the legislative committee, and while I'm here, I'd like to commend an excellent committee. It was a pleasure serving with you. <laughs> Trying to get discharged in can Jim? You've heard the motion to discharge the committee with the thanks of the convention. We had a second, I believe I heard one. Any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. All opposed? Thank you so much, Jim, and your committee for a job well done. This time I'm going to call on the chairman of the Public Relations and Education Committee, Brother Schaefer. I believe he has one more resolution to complete their report. Brother Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is resolution number 20. <clears throat> number 20. Submitted by your executive board. Whereas organized labor has always acted in the knowledge that there is a direct and close relationship between the well-being of their members and of the general public and the communities in which they serve, and whereas our members must become more active workers in those community agencies which are designed to improve the general health and welfare of the families in our communities, and whereas labor has bettered its public relations program in those areas where it uh, has an active community services committee and program conducted through the local central labor councils and whereas it would be to the trade union members personal advantage and advancement for his organization should the members community work be done through his union organization therefore be it resolved that each local union and central council intensify their efforts to build a better and more active community services program and be it further resolved that a part of the agenda of each meeting shall include a report of the activities of this committee and be it finally resolved that a report shall be made quarterly to the Public Relations Vice President of the Mississippi Labor Council AFL-CIO by the Chairman of each Community Services Committee. Our committee concurs in this and I move its adoption. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt the resolution. We did have a second. Do we have any discussion? The young lady, Miss Gandhi, did a right neat job of pointing out the need, I think, of this resolution. The necessity of our people participating in community affairs. This is something I think we overlook too often, we're not participating in enough of, and it's time we got on with the job. <clears throat> Any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. I move that the committee be discharged with an expression of thanks for their work. You've heard the motion and there was a second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Thank you for a job well done, Brother Schaefer. All right, Brother Schaefer would like just a minute. I'd like to take this opportunity because I know just as soon as the next committee chairman reports, much of the, or many of the delegates of the convention is gonna be on their way home. I'm referring to Brother Ferguson. He ain't gonna get it next. He ain't gonna get it. <laughs> He's not. Well, good. But I'd just like to say uh, a few remarks in regards to my election. It was with 
a great deal of hesitancy and reluctance that I accepted nomination uh, for the job of vice president. There's several reasons for that. One is, due to my work, I'm limited to some degree on time uh, to fulfill the needs of this office. Another thing is, due to my work, I'm well aware of the many, many problems facing uh, the labor movement in the state of Mississippi. Aware of those problems, uh, the, uh, the old law of self-preservation, I guess, comes into play. So naturally, I'd like to renege on it. But since so, some of those problems are real close to me, then I feel the obligation to do what little I might do. I believe one of the best illustrations of one of the problems, which is many of the problems that we're confronted with, can best be expressed by a few words in regards to a case that we are approaching arbitration on. Some of you, to some of you, it will be a little repetitious. Uh, to some of you, it will probably be the first time you've heard it. And this is dealing with one of our members who was president of the Greenville Central Labor Council, Bill Thompson. Now, because about 12 or 13 people in the Greenville area didn't like his activities in assisting other crafts and unions to organize, some of the organized people, unorganized people in that area, they complained to his employer, the Mississippi Power and Light Company, that he was creating bad relations for the company in that area. As a result of this, the company closed his job and moved him to Jackson. Well, naturally, we are processing a grievance on it on the grounds of discrimination by virtue of his being a union member. Now, <clears throat> if they're successful in this, and I might also say this, their position is simply uh, stated in a few words that even the National Labor Relations Act only protects him with his individual local union. Now, I don't have to say any more to let you know the atmosphere that the state of Mississippi is in, and that is if there's any progress to be made in organized labor in the state of Mississippi, should they be successful in attaining that position, then you will have to buy everyone that serves in organizing efforts and pay for their time. Now, that would be uh, beyond my comprehension at this time to think that we could make progress under that atmosphere. That case is scheduled for a hearing, probably in Jackson. We haven't decided on the case. Their attorney is insisting it be held in Jackson. On the eighth day of next month, this is of real interest to the labor movement throughout the United States inasmuch as there is not a United States Supreme Court decision sustaining uh, a case of this nature. The company has indicated to us that nothing short of that will satisfy them. They might as well tell us that the Manufacturers Association and the Chamber of Commerce has made an example of this and they'll see it through to the end. We need the support of labor, not only in the state of Mississippi, but throughout the United States, because to me and to the people who are real close to this case, uh, it is of utmost interest uh, to the labor movement, uh, as uh, even on a national basis. So let's keep that in mind and keep your eyes open for the progress of this case. We don't intend to drop it. Uh, until the company is satisfied with it. If need be, uh, we think we're in a position to take it to the United States Supreme Court. The man is still working. We're thankful for that. So we can fight him for quite a while with the assistance of all of you good people. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Jack, for those appropriate and timely remarks. The situation he refers to is one of the utmost importance to each and every one of us in this meeting today, particularly those people serving in the capacities of leadership in local and central bodies, local central bodies, that assist our organizers in their efforts to organize the unorganized workers. This situation has disturbed me a great deal. I don't think there's anyone in the room that feels any stronger about this situation than I do myself. We have assured the gentlemen involved, the local union involved, by action of the executive board, that they do have the wholehearted support of the state labor movement. We cannot allow a situation of this kind to continue to exist in this state of ours. As American citizens, this man has been denied his right as a citizen of this nation to do with his time as he sees fit when he's not on the job. We have that young man as a delegate in this convention. He is president of this Greenville Central Labor Union, living in the city of Jackson at the present time. Bill Thompson is a dedicated member of the trade union movement. Anyone that will live in Jackson and commute back and forth to Greenville to participate in the affairs of that central body certainly has to be dedicated, and certainly he should receive the undivided support of this labor movement. And I want to introduce Brother Bill Thompson. There he is back there. That's the gentleman we're talking about. Now this, uh, as riled up as I can get over this matter, I could speak the rest of the afternoon over it, but we have a lot of business at hand. Brother Daniel, did you want to say a word? Just wanted to, just wanted to comment, Mr. Chairman, that this is not an isolated case. It's also happening to some CWA representatives in Corinth, Tupelo, and Greenville, and perhaps some inferences and, and uh, innuendos and a little intimidation in other places. So it's not an isolated instance. Uh, the pattern seems to be well cut. They want to try to sew it together, it seems. Evidently, that's true. I intend to appear before the arbitration panel on this case myself. I want to present the views of our people to this panel in the presence of the officials of the Mississippi Power and Light Company, who a lot of our members are customers of. I want to advise those people of a few things. I think it's uh, that it's the time is overdue to do just that. Again, I can get riled up and get started again. Now, we have several committees yet to report. We have yet the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. But at this time, I'm going to recognize the chairman of the Social Insurance Committee, Sister Frieda Gunton. Before I uh, Frieda get started, I've been advised by Thomas, uh, Secretary Thomas Knight, that he's made arrangements with the hotel that you won't have to check out before 7 p.m. Now, certainly we should be out of here within not too long a time from now. We, we don't have too much more to do, depending upon the amount of discussion and so forth. So that arrangement has been made if some of you are disturbed about it. Sister Guyton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will you please look in your kits and find resolution number 10. And, uh, I would also, in this connection, like to call your attention to other uh, literature in your uh, kit on this same uh, subject that I would uh, urge you to read, and uh, it will give you considerable information on this uh, resolution. Uh, this resolution was submitted by your executive board. Whereas one of the real tragedies of our time 
is that which beset so many of our senior citizens in the autumn days of their lives. During the golden years when they should be allowed to enjoy the fruits of their toil, they are faced with the prospect of seeing the earnings of an entire lifetime washed away by one serious case of illness and subsequent high cost of hospital and medical care. And whereas it would appear that all humanity in our state and nation would view this situation with anxiety and alarm, that they would hasten to support corrective legislation and eliminate this grave inequity. Strangely enough, this is not the case. Today we find several groups led by the American Medical Association waging an all-out attack against the logical solution medical care for the aged financed through Social Security. As in the case of, uh, of any and all legislation designed to aid the masses, the well-worn word socialism is injected. And whereas for a number of years, the American Medical Associ Association and its satellite refused to acknowledge the fact that a problem existed in this area. After several years of debate throughout the nation, it is interesting to note that these groups have finally conceded the fact that a problem does exist and that something should be done about it. In making this concession, however, the American Medical Association and its cohort still refuse to face up to reality. And whereas, in an obvious attempt to circumvent the wishes of the vast majority of Americans, these groups have recently embarked upon a campaign of confusion and deviation by supporting a number of medical care plans, none of which offers the answer to the overriding problem. Senate Bill 1560, which was recently adopted by the Mississippi Legislature, falls in this category. The same can be said of other plans being promoted by various other groups. The Kerr-Mills Bill, adopted by the last Congress with the American Medical Association's support, does not scratch the surface, even though it does fill a definite need. And whereas President Kennedy assured the American people during his presidential campaign that he would exert all of his influence toward the passage of a medical care plan for the aged, financed through Social Security. Shortly after taking office, such a plan was introduced in the Anderson-King Bill. Unfortunately, this piece of legislation has been locked in the Ways and Means Committee of the House of Representatives ever since. Chairman Wilbur Mills, Arkansas, co-author of the American Medical Association-sponsored bill last year, seems determined to prevent the Congress from having the opportunity of voting on the Kennedy-supported measure. The American people must let themselves be heard if this bill is to receive congressional consideration. And whereas a study of the Anderson-King bill and attendant issues disclosed the following facts. One, it provides for hospital and medical care financed through Social Security. In essence, two, in essence, it amounts to prepaid hospital and medical care. You pay the premium while you are young and able to work. Three, the cost is equally shared by the employer and the employee. Each would pay one-fourth of one percent. The, four, the elder citizen would not be required to take a pauper's oath. Benefit would be a matter of right, not charity. Five, as they should, the young will help carry the old. Six, similar plans are now in effect in several European countries and have proven to be very successful. Seven, the Social Security system is firmly established and can administer the plan with little additional cost involved. Eight, the Kerr-Mills bill adopted last year only takes care of the indigent and is dependent upon the state's participation. It fills a definite need but does not go to the heart of the problem. 
plans offered by various insurance companies are prohibitive due, it, due to high premium costs. At best, they could only be considered as supplements. 10. The Anderson King Bill would provide medical and hospital care to a larger percent of Americans than any other proposal. 95% of all workers and their wives at the age of 65 would be covered. Therefore, be it resolved that the delegates assembled in convention do hereby endorse the concepts of medical care for the age financed through Social Security and will seek the passage of the Anderson King Bill or any other legislation so designed. Mr. Chairman, the committee uh, concurs in this uh, resolution and I move the adoption. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt. Do we have any discussion on the motion? I think this area, again, was well covered in remarks prior to the committee's report, the need of it. All in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. You'd like to and discharge? Mr. Chairman, that's all the resolutions in this committee, and we'd like to be discharged. The chairman of the committee moves that her committee be discharged with the thanks of the convention. We have any discussion on that motion? Not all in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed, motion carried and so ordered. Thank you, Freedom. Don't have anybody else left, so I guess I'm going to have to call on the chairman of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. He's been giving me a bad time up here about when am I going to get around to him. He's bad as Dan Powell about pushing him off the platform and off the program. So at this time, I'm going to call on the chairman of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee to complete that report. He's given a partial report already. Brother Smith Hart. Well, I finally made it after two days. I'd like for you to look in your kits and take resolution number one, two, four, and five. You've had those since Monday. <laughs> The committee has adopted unanimously all these uh, proposed constitutional changes without a descending vote. And I'd like to know if, uh, if any of you, uh, uh, to get this thing over with, I'm ready to get out of here. And if you people have read these uh, changes, one, two, four, and five, the committee, I will say, unanimously adopted them, and if it's in order, uh, I will make a motion to the effect that these uh, four resolutions be adopted at one time, if you read them. That's one way I get the job, doesn't it? I'm going to accept that motion that we act on all of them at one time. We had a second, I believe, over here. Do we have any discussion on that motion? If not, all in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Well, I've done found out how to get something done in this convention. Brother Smith, all right. You had a couple of other resolutions, number 21 and number 22. Uh, if you've read those and studied them, I don't know where you had time or not, but this is more or less to clarify some of the uh, provisions in the Constitution and bylaws, and I, they were short, and I will read those because you hadn't had those but about an hour and a half. The Constitution and Bylaws Committee adopted these, wrote them up in committee meetings. It says, whereas the word laws in Article 4, Section 5 of the Mississippi Labor Council Constitution is not clear and is in full meaning, and whereas it is not consistent with other phrases phases in the Constitution, therefore be it resolved that the word laws be changed to read Constitution and bylaws. In other words, that's what we are, the Constitution and Bylaws Committee, and we just make it conform with the Constitution. I so move the adoption. You heard the motion to adopt the resolution. Is there any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. All opposed? 
Motion carried and so ordered. I want you to get this one to the rest of them, while I go. I would like to say the uh, committee uh, had a lot of work to do, and we would like to let you know what we did do in that. And I would like to be against that motion just for a few minutes. Uh, I don't think the motion had a second, so I'll read number. Recognition. No recognition on it. Motion, resolution number 21, this is by the Constitution Bylaw Committee. Whereas Article 4, Section 5 of the Mississippi Labor Council Constitution is inadequate to cover full services offered by union labor. And whereas the craft unions have been overlooked by union label drives, therefore be it resolved that the word union label be changed to read Union Labor and Labels Committee. The committee so moves. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt the resolution. Is there any discussion? I think the resolution is self-explanatory. Simply means that we, when, when we have something to do, we should call on our friends in the labor movement to do the job. That's how simple it is. Any discussion? No, no. All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. We have another resolution here. Uh, we felt uh, to change the name of the labor movement in the state, I will speak on a motion if it's necessary after I read it. Whereas the time of the merger of the AFL and the CIO in Mississippi, the combined organizations was named Mississippi Labor Council AFL-CIO. And whereas since that time it has become apparent that this name has caused confusion in the minds of the public by implying that this council is a state agency or some other organization in Mississippi. And whereas, in addition to the confusion caused by the name, and it has also become apparent that the name is too long and, and cumbersome, and that it is desirable to shorten the name and be to more clearly label this council in order to eliminate the possibility that some may consider this as a state agent or some other state organization. Now be it resolved that the first biennial convention of the Mississippi Labor Council, AFL-CIO, does hereby go on record to change the name of this council effectively immediately upon adjournment of this convention and upon approval of the president of AFL-CIO to Mississippi AFL-CIO and be it further resolved that the office of the council are hereby directed to use all material presently bearing the name of the Mississippi Labor Council AFL-CIO but that all future printing and cetera shall bear the name Mississippi AFL-CIO only. And it be it finally resolved that in the, if the president of AFL-CIO shall refuse to approve the new name for the council, it shall then remain as the Mississippi Labor Council AFL-CIO. The committee so moves. You've heard the committee's report, recommendation to Change the name of the council to Mississippi to the Mississippi AFL CIO. I think the chairman of the committee has explained to you the need of it. Louisiana, just recently at their convention, did exactly just that because of the confusion existing in the minds of a lot of people. We have that definitely true in Mississippi. I can attest to that. Do we have any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, signify it by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Smith Hart. The committee also found in the Constitution there's lots of things should be changed, should be done. It's just impossible for this committee to do a job that should be done in three short days and the time we had to meet on it. And we would like to make a recommendations to this council at this convention. To go back a little farther, this constitution was adopted in approximately taking 18 months of work for a committee to do it. Of course, at that time, the AFL and the CIO, they would look at one another, you know, they didn't know them. Today we know everybody knows one another and we know we all for the same thing. So 
to adopt a uh, constitution and the bylaws to rewrite it, we couldn't do it in you know, three days, but I think it could be done in a period of time. Uh, this committee recommends that the president appoint a committee to rewrite this constitution instead of just uh, amend it, to rewrite it, to conform with the, thing, with the time that we are in, uh, some of the programs that we have adopted, and a lot of other things that needs to be done and clarified. And this time, I make the motion that the president appoint a committee to draft or uh, rewrite a constitution that can present back to the next convention. Second motion. You've heard the committee's recommendation to appoint a committee, I suspect, to study and make recommendations for changes at a future convention, Array. Uh, do we have any discussion on this motion, this recommendation? I'd like to make an inquiry of the chairman of the committee. Is this no, is, is this supposed to be delegates to this convention or members of duly affiliated organizations or where is the committee supposed to come from? Well, in our discussion, we didn't uh, uh, say it should come from the board. Uh, uh, we didn't say that it should, uh, some of them are off the board. We didn't, we didn't mention that. But I don't think that we would, uh, uh, the committee would be approved of having someone uh, uh, from a local union is not affiliated with this council right in our constitution. So I think it would be in order for the president, it is our intent for him to appoint cable people that know something about a constitution and the bylaws that they might draft it. But I would say that they should be, his organization should be affiliated with this council. Well, that's uh, understandable. I was wondering if it's supposed to be a delegate. I see Brother Beckham's got the mic over here. I'm going to let him have Brother Beckham. Brother Chairman, just a point of information in rewriting the uh, Constitution and changing the name of the organization, does that mean you're going to apply for a new charter? I suspect that the charter would have to be brought in the line. This, of course, all has to meet the approval of the president of the AFL-CO, George Meany. And I suspect that when this is done, that he will want the charter sent in and this necessary correction made. That, as, as a rule, this is the way it's done. We have any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion, signify it by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Brother Smith Hart. I'd like to say I've enjoyed serving with this uh, convention as a chairman of the Constitution Committee, and uh, I suppose the other committee members like myself would like to be discharged, and I so move. You heard the chairman's motion to discharge the committee with the thanks of the convention, and certainly they should receive the thanks of this convention because they have spent long hours trying to figure out what should be done with this document and finally arrived at the conclusion that not enough time was allowed to do the job. Do we have any discussion on the motion to discharge the committee? If not, all in favor of that motion signify it by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Now, we have only one committee left, I believe. Do we have other committees to report? We have held the chairman of the election committee in abeyance because we found that once you receive the results of the election that half of the convention would make a stampede for the door and we still had a lot of business to take care of. Now, after he makes his report, there will still be some business that the convention will have to tend to. It will only take a few short minutes, so I'd like to request that after he makes his report that you remain for a few minutes. We've got to install the officers. The decision will have to be made about the next convention site and things of this kind before we adjourn. So at this time, I present old buddy Red Ferguson, chairman of the elections committee. 
Thank you, Brother Ramsey. I have no apologies actually to make to you. I guess all this delay has been done intentionally. <laughs> I've been trying to make reports since about one o'clock and I just now got up here to where I can give you a report. However, I am happy that I didn't make a report earlier because I, as chairman of the committee, and I'm not a lawyer, but I do, when I read something, I think I'm right in it, and I so rule before lunch. I rule that uh, a man or a woman or a delegate to be elected would have to receive a majority of the credential delegates. And after reading it, I understood that I made a mistake in interpreting what the Constitution said. The Constitution so reads, and I think you'll bear me out in this, uh, to be elected, you have to receive a majority of the votes cast. That's what the Constitution says. And I was basing mine on the number that was given me by the credential committee, that a man would have to receive a majority of the credentials committee, in other words, the report that they gave us, and that determined that there would not be a runoff in the election. I told you before they would be, but they will not, because they were 10 people received a majority of the votes cast. And I'll give you the uh, names of the people that will serve you as the uh, board members of the Mississippi Labor Council. Bill Bull, Bowers, Conde, Gillespie. If, I, if I'm reading too fast, did any of you miss one? I'll start over then. I'm sorry, I, I didn't think about you writing them down. Bill Bull, Bowers, Conde, Gillespie, Goodman. Now this is one that I pronounce in my own interpretation. Galat. I'd pronounce it different from that if I was going to pronounce it, but well, somebody told me that's how you pronounce it. Guyton. Kelly, Knee Case, Stevenson, Stevens. Is that the ten? You have ten. Any questions? Brother Chairman, I'd like to thank the committee that worked with me on this election committee. I think it's one of the best committees that I've ever worked on or been associated with. And at the same time, I would like to pay tribute to another committee that has worked so hard in this convention since Sunday. And I'd like to see the delegates here seated rise with thanks to Jack Geiger and his committee, the Credential Committee. I'd like to see you rise. To You know, in any convention or most any organization you have, you have workhorses and you have people like me that don't do anything. And this has been a committee that has been working continuously since Sunday afternoon, and we are proud of them, and that's the reason I ask you to do that. Brother Chairman, I thank you for the confidence and placing me on this committee, and I would at this time move that the committee be discharged with thanks to the convention. Thank you.
you've heard the request of the chairman to be discharged with the thanks of the committee. Do we have any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. All opposed, motion carried and so ordered. As brother, yeah. Bob, Bob Stone is in house. Bob, would you come up here, please? I was going to call on Bill Hines, the former president of the Old State Federation, to install the newly elected officers. But I understand that he's outside and not available. I failed to tell him to stay around unless it's over with. I would like at this time, before we call the officers forward for the installation, bring this matter of the convention site and so forth to your attention for a decision. See what your pleasure is. Brother Smith. Uh, br Brother President, I believe that uh, we should leave this uh, matter solely to the executive board to conserve time. You should move that, that you make a motion in this direction? Motion is that the matter of selecting the convention site and time and so forth be referred to your executive board for a decision. We have a second. Any discussion? Not all in favor of that motion, let it be known by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and sorted. And before I ask the newly elected officers to come forward, I've got a few remarks that I want to make in behalf of the retiring officers of the council and I see there are some retiring executive board members that have served this council for the last two years. We have been privileged in this organization to have had some of our finest people serving on your executive board as well as your executive committee. It's been a real pleasure for myself to have been afforded the opportunity to have associated with these gentlemen in this past two years. And I know that I speak the sentiments of the convention when I say that they have served you well. And I feel that your incoming in board will also serve you well. And looking your newly elected board members over, I think you have selected some fine people. We had uh, as your executive committee, Brother K.M. Holloway, who did not seek re-election because of having taken a job with the Department of Labor in their apprenticeship section. K.M. Holloway did an outstanding job as business agent of his local union, president of the Central Bank, heading up the Building and Trades Council in that section. It was a real loss to have lost his services. I know he has been replaced with another very fine gentleman out of the same organization. We lost the services of another exceedingly, exceptionally qualified man as one of your vice presidents who has served in various capacities of this organization in a number of years. Brother Ray Smithart, who took a job, is in employment now with his international union. And I know by leaving this organization, it doesn't mean that Ray won't continue to help plug for the welfare of labor in Mississippi. He has assured me that he'll do everything he can on the affiliation problem. The same thing can be said of each and every board member that has been replaced or the ones that did not seek re-election. I think the labor movement today is on its way. I think it's established that say, itself in that direction here in this convention. Personally, as president of the organization, I look forward to the progress ahead, the job ahead, with a great deal of satisfaction that we will accomplish those objectives. For those few remarks, 
I'm going to ask the newly elected board members, the newly elected officers, to please come forward for the installation. Thank you. Well, they're coming up here, I think. Uh, Dan Powell's remarks were very timely that we can apply this political skill that we got in this organization and the electing some members of that House of Representatives, we turn this thing around in no time flat. Let's see what else. Well, the officers and board members, please raise their right hands and repeat after me. Use your name where I use my name. I, Robert Starnes, do hereby promise to faithfully perform the duties of the office to which I have been elected to the very best of my ability and to the benefit and honor of the Mississippi Labor Council. In the event of resignation or removal from office or at the expiration of my term, I promise to deliver to my successor all property in my possession belonging to this council. I further promise to protect and defend the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations during my term of office. May I congratulate each and every one of you upon your election and wish you the happiest and most successful term in office that any human being could have. And say further, as I said yesterday, if there's anything that I can do to help any one of you or all of you, or that our office can do, please call on us. Congratulations to you, Brother President. It's yours again. Thank you. I'd like to advise the board that they will begin their work day at 10 o'clock in the morning in Parlor A. Board meeting in Parlor A at 10 o'clock sharp in the morning. 10 o'clock in Parlor A, I'm talking to you people. 10 o'clock in Parlor A, and you boys. All have a seat. Now, before we leave, before we adjourn the convention, I'd like to extend an opportunity of a few words to your secretary and treasurer. Tom? Where's Tom? Tom said he wanted to say just a few words. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to say thank you for everything. You've been a good group here. Certainly we look forward to your cooperation as we attempt to continue our duties in your behalf. You'll notice on the table there, scattered up and down the tables, the ashtrays. Mississippi Labor Council on them. Pick them up, put them in your pocket, take them home with you. Thank you so much. We're now down to welfare of the council. Mr. Chairman. Let's have order, please. Sorry, Ronnie, we haven't adjourned yet. Please uh, be seated for just a minute. Brother Daniel, we of the Jackson Central Labor Union and all of the union people in this area would like to extend an invitation to the council for its meetings uh, next year. Uh, as well as subsequent years, incidentally. And uh, I move that the board uh, give full consideration to accepting our invitation to return its convention to Jackson next year. We have a motion at the board. How did you phrase that? Yeah. Consideration? You know, full consideration. Full consideration. To bring in the convention back to Jackson, I you said next year, I assume at the next convention. It might be next year, it might be the two years from now, but it is the next convention. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor of that motion, let it be known by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so on. Do we have anything else on the welfare of the council? If not, the first biannual convention of the Mississippi Labor Council is now adjourned stand down.
That Promise to meet the group of girls up here. Well, that's the best I know.
and neighborhood characteristics with his counterpart, who was without physical handicap. Ninety-five different activities were compared. These activities were classified into experience categories as follows. One, social experiences with other children and adults in various situations. Two, recognition experiences through the use of books, records, and other tangible items that help in child development, plus emphasis resulting from parent, uh, parental care and interest. Three, outside experiences such as trips to business places, parks, or even extended tours, and attendance at sports events, fairs, or other public gatherings. Four, enlightening experiences through memorizing songs and poems, gaining knowledge of simple sources of foodstuffs, and listening to radio or watching television programs, handling of simple tools, participating in programs for public presentation, in games, and, in, and other similar practices, and five other uncategorized experiences. Results of the analysis of the items indicated that almost every experience of any kind significantly favors the normal child. In general, it seems that especially necessary experiences for the handicapped child are as follows. One, to have association and friendship with other children, since constructive group experience is so necessary for a well-rounded life. Two, to learn to live in a world that extends beyond his family. Three, to have opportunities for play in order to stimulate imagination, channel hostility, and release strong emotions. Now, in addition to experiences such as these is the need for specially prescribed activities of a directly therapeutic nature. In other words, ex uh, therapeutic experiences. Now, whether these are accomplished by a special therapist, another capable person, or by the parents probably is only of minor significance, depending on the child's needs and response. More important is the need for certain activities for selected children to be accomplished. One might illustrate this latter suggestion in uh, any one of several ways. Suffice it to use the wearing of braces for preventing contractures as an example. Within the past week, two boys were again seen with essentially the same degree of physical involvement in both cases severe. Each of these boys has been followed for a period of several years. As of 18 months ago, while under a special facility program, each had no contractual deformity. Contra contractures were prevented up to that time in various ways, but including the use of braces locked at the knee for periods throughout the day. Each boy has been under a home program during the past 18 months. In the one instance, the parents have followed recommendations for therapeutic experiences very faithfully and the results are good, namely no contractures at this time. In the other instance, because the parents were at first lax in locking knee joints in the braces, and in the past six months even negligent in having the braces worn at all, their boy now needs surgical, certain surgical procedures. One, to make his personal hygienic needs easier to be cared for, and two, to make it possible for him to distribute weight more evenly in sitting rather than for all of it to be on one bony prominence. Obviously, close, cooperative functioning between the parents and professional people working with their child is of major necessity. Again, numerous experiences to include certain appropriately prescribed therapeutic activities must be given special attention to achieve optimum functioning in the handicapped child. How one relates to others is another factor of great significance in optimum functioning. Since optimum functioning is dependent in part upon how closely one's self-concept approximates how he is perceived by others, Relating well to others has dual importance. In the first place, for the personal satisfaction in achieving the success which will make one more acceptable to others, and secondly, by the actual acceptance by others. These statements, although applicable for the handicapped as well as the non-handicapped, are perhaps of greater pertinency to the handicapped person because certain atypical physiques complicate the situation for the handicapped in most instances. 
There are many traits which enhance one's ability to relate to others. Only a few will be mentioned here in order to suggest their nature. Such personal characteristics as appearance, voice and speech, ability to present ideas, emotional stability, originality, social poise and tact, self-confidence, friendliness, vitality, and many other such factors are seemingly most significant in, in enhancing this ability to relate well with others. Development of these and similar characteristics results from experiences. One excellent way for such attributes to be encouraged is for the parents to foster good relationships between all members of the family. As near to the same requirements as possible, being expected of the handicapped member of the family as the others. In addition, guidance and direction of the patient towards accomplishments of this nature must be the common goal of every pro uh, professional person involved in his care. An environment that fosters improvement in what can be changed and acceptance of what cannot be altered, obviously, is also desirable for the development of optimum functioning. For the vast majority, the greatest environmental influence on the child is exerted by the home and family. A host of different influences operate to varying extents and in different degrees. For example, some of the feelings of many parents, namely guilt, shame, and pity, with the tendency for these attitudes to be evidenced by attendant rejection or over solicitousness directed towards the child, hardly creates confidence or fosters independent action in the child. From outside the home, society exerts the forces of curiosity, pity, over solicitousness, dislike, fear, unacceptance, and other pressures. Thus, it is not surprising that frequently one finds the involved individual lacking social contacts and even assuming a withdrawn existence. It is assumed that many parents suffer from these forces also and likewise tend to withdraw. To accomplish optimum functioning, the handicapped individual must build up a formidable wall of resistance through experiences, guidance, and development of self-confidence to counteract these forces from within and without. All persons involved in, this care, in his care have the opportunity to help him to this end. Now thus far, very little mention has been made of specific treatment. This was alluded to under the earlier consideration of experiences. However, nothing has been said about bracing, surgery, medication, and other so-called specific, uh, specific measures. Conceivably, some may think that such, such emphasis should be given top priority. However, up till now, various measure, uh, measures pertinent to op optimum functioning for all patients have been presented. One is probably referring to the needs of far less than a fourth of all handicapped children when he discusses the use of braces, less than 10% when he considers surgery, and probably a figure much lower than 5% when he mentions medication. Certainly these measures are of great importance as adjunctive aids to achieve the most favorable performance in selected children, but in themselves are not expected to account for optimum functioning. Furthermore, use of these measures is limited to a relatively few. Now, although there are many suggested measures to aid the handicapped child achieve optimum function, functioning, of great importance is adherence to the appropriate longitudinal timetable for accomplishing the various items if maximum benefits are to result. Of great importance in this regard is the child's physiological adequacy for a specific activity or his psychological readiness or the aptness of his immediate develop, developmental stage, or his emotional suitability. So the ability to recommend the appropriate emphasis in the patient for whatever is necessary becomes an art rather than a strict science, and of necessity is utilized according to the child's individual need. Nevertheless, the earlier the attention is directed to improving the child's deviant functioning, the more favorable outcome can one expect 
if measures appropriate for the functioning status are used. Goals for accomplishment in various ancillary areas of management, as well as all-inclusive ones for the given individual, are of great importance. Bear in mind, however, that the desired endpoint is a well-adjusted total individual, regardless of certain constituent parts which may be deviant in their functioning. This suggests that as much or more constructive attention must be focused on the appropriate development of near-normal attributes in the individual, as is given to his deviant characteristics. After all, in the majority of instances, even under the most ideal management program, the handicapped features of the individual are probably always going to be present significantly. Yet they may be overshadowed by effective use of his non-deviant characteristics. Now, in summary, an attempt has been made to focus attention on a few of the factors, special emphasis towards which will be expected to foster optimum functioning in a handicapped individual. Attention to these factors is not the prerogative of any one specialty group. Rather, these influences must be adopted for attention by every person involved in the child's care. Those factors which have been stressed especially as regards the patient are as follows. A, motivation and self-drive. B, feeling secure. C, being provided with opportunities to experience. D, learning to relate well with others. E, learning to adjust to adverse environmental forces. And F, following an appropriate timetable suitable for the needs which are requiring attention. In most situations, the physician, nurse, teacher, social worker, therapist, parents, and others must provide guidance to achieve these ends in a coordinated, coordinated fashion and with continuity if maximum results are to be achieved. The major concern must be with the child who has the handicap rather than with the handicap itself. Worthy of the highest priority in attempting to achieve optimum functioning in the handicap are the following procedures in patient management. One, the earliest possible evaluation of the child. Two, recurrent appraisals to maintain awareness of changes and developing problems. Three, careful interpretation of the child's situation to his parents and others specifically involved with his management. Four, establishing and periodically reviewing goals for immediate and long-range attainment. And five, developing a means of accomplishing the desired objectives, regardless of the specialty consciousness of those involved in his care. Thank you. Out of the out-of-state market and force it back into the Mississippi market, and that was the very reason I asked Mr. Dell, or Mr. Avent, if he, if such a price caused that milk to be uh, rejected in Memphis, if he would receive that, even if it meant the expense of uh, lowering his blend a dollar, a dollar and a half, a hundred, and his answer was no. Therefore, I wonder what we would do with that milk. They've got a right to produce milk, uh, and, and I don't think the Milk Commission has a right to price them out of the market. Your uh, recommendation? I feel like that the effect... I feel like the, the effect of the, uh, uh, of the pricing in Mississippi, uh, which I think has already been admitted that so far as the supply to man is concerned, will be about 25 cents from Memphis to here over and above what the actual supply-demand uh, picture would reflect, I think the very uh, existence of this, you might say, partially false 25 cents that we have discussed will have a healthy effect on those producers that might be shipping out of the state. I am sure that it will have that effect on the producer shipping into Alabama. I'm not as sure that it will into Mississippi, but I, that is, I'm not as sure with respect to those sh 
producers in Mississippi who are shipping into the Memphis area. Uh, however, I think that uh, anything further than than a, a, a than the influence of the Mississippi pricing uh, would be dangerous. As I follow the questions here today, uh, did that answer you? The uh, Suggestions were not towards full regulation, but rather to some type of equalization payment, compensatory payment, probably what you made. Uh, on milk that comes back, that we only own that amount of milk that re enters the state in competition with milk that is priced by the Commission. Now, uh, that uh, What is, your, what is your impression on that? I, I, it's beyond my imagination as to how you can determine what milk came back into the Mississippi, and if so, what amount of that was in Class 1 sales. And if you could determine that, where would you pay, uh, to what agency would you pay the money uh, uh, on such a, uh, an amount of milk and if you could find that agency, how would you allocate that to all of, to the to the to Avance producers and to the Delta producers and to the uh, 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 Jackson, Mississippi seal testers in Jackson, Mississippi today, from Memphis and Brookhaven, Mississippi, from New Orleans? How would you uh, 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 pay that money back? to Mississippi producers, and to what producers would you pay it to? I mean, you, you've got, uh, I, I can't conceive of the mechanics that you would have to go through to. My impression. Uh, Let me to put a new record on the record, Ryan. <laughs> 